Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking about Chris Chan, who was recently arrested for allegedly having sex with her mother, who is in her 80s. Chris's mother also has dementia, which makes these allegations even more heinous. Chris Chan herself is 39 and is a male to female transgender person, so she was born male. This happened after a series of text messages were leaked in which she claims to have slept with her. Here are some screenshots of the text messages. Now, some of the things Chris admits to doing to her are too disgusting for me to show you, but basically she talks about performing oral sex on her mother, implies they had vaginal sex, and says that she can feel their souls bonding when they cuddle. A troll also called her on the phone and was able to trick her into admitting that she had slept with her mother. The incest fanfics have come true and shit. How did you approach her? I approached her with care and caution, her, and I encouraged her positively, let her make the first move. She wanted to do it. She oh, she did? Really? She made the first move? Yeah. She was partially confused at one point, but but then she came around, obviously. How was the sex? Uh, I'd say it was satisfactory. It took a while. It took a few tries. Obviously, I'm never going to propose marriage to her at all because we're already daughter and mom. Mm -hmm. We've been doing it every third night. And the first night being on June 27. Yeah, she's having a good time, by the way. She is? She's having a good time? Especially, especially what, we, what we figured out. Okay, so that's pretty sick. When this information was released, Chris Chan was removed from her mother's home and was later arrested at a motel. She was denied bail and is currently in the Henrico County Jail. Now, the reason I want to talk about this case is that Chris Chan has autism, which she never really got help for, and both her parents and the internet seem to have made her problems a lot worse, and I think this has played a role in leading her to where she is today. Obviously, Chris Chan is responsible for what she did and should be punished for it, and I agree with people who think Chris Chan is a bad person. But there's a conversation to be had here about the dangers of the internet, and what could have been done earlier in Chris's life that might have stopped her from getting to this point. I have autism myself, so this is a subject that I can probably understand better than most. As you might imagine, the transgender community is outraged about this case, and there's a discussion being had about whether Chris was truly transgender or whether there was something else going on. I don't know the answer to this question, and when I don't know, I tend to give people the benefit of the doubt, so I'm going to be using female pronouns when I'm talking about Chris after her transition throughout this video. You might not agree with that, but this is just my way of remaining neutral. So first of all, if you don't know much about who Chris Chan is, she's a person with autism who has some strange childlike hobbies, who doesn't really have any friends, and who has basically spent the past 15 years being trolled by people on the internet. A bunch of people, mostly from 4chan, discovered the things she was posting, and they started making fun of her and tricking her into doing ridiculous things, often of a sexual nature. This made her even more strange and more delusional, which made people want to troll her even more, and it basically became this constant feedback loop of depravity that has lasted for over a decade, and which was extensively documented by the people responsible for it, because they wanted to show off to all their internet buddies and be like, hey, look what I got Chris to do. Uh, Chris also made public responses to many of the things they did, and has been what might be called a content creator on the internet for nearly 20 years. Because of this, Chris Chan is probably the most documented person on the internet. There's a documentary being made about her life by a YouTuber named Gino Samuel that currently has 59 parts and is over 40 hours long. So that gives you an idea of how much information is out there. If you want to know more about Chris's life, you can watch that documentary, which I've linked in the description. There's also a much shorter documentary that's only an hour long. It was made by a high school student and is quite good, so I'll link that one in the description as well. I'm going to have to give you guys an abridged version of some of the stuff these documentaries talk about in order to explain what was going on with Chris, but if you want all the backstory, you should check them out if you have time. Now, you might look at Chris Chan, see the way she looks and acts, see that she's been arrested for having sex with her mother, and think, okay, this person is a freak. Yet, what's sad about Chris Chan is that she wasn't always the way she is now. Chris Chan was once a young man who, despite having a learning disability, was going to college for computer-aided drafting and design, and like many other young men with autism, was frustrated with not knowing how to get a girlfriend. Unfortunately, he had no male friends or role models, and there wasn't anyone in his life that was able to tell him how dating worked, and he ended up deciding that the best way to get a girlfriend would be to go on a love quest, where he would carry an attraction sign around public places advertising that he wanted a boyfriend-free girl, and listing off all of the traits he wanted his boyfriend-free girl to have. This was what first got the troll's attention, and where the story of his trolling begins. So the first thing I'm going to do is explain how he got to this point, which is also going to help explain everything that happened after it. Part 1. Chris's parents failed him as a child. If you don't know much about autism, it's a learning disability that impairs a person's social functioning. People with autism have trouble understanding social cues, like facial expressions and body language, and they also have trouble understanding how other people's minds work. This makes it hard for them to tell what other people are thinking and feeling. 
If a person with autism gets help early in life, a lot of this can be mitigated and they can go on to live relatively normal lives. However, if they don't, they can end up being isolated from their peers, and the isolation combined with the effects of autism can cause them to develop extremely strange ideas about human nature and society that never end up being challenged or corrected because they're alone and have nobody to help them. This is what appears to have happened to Chris. Chris grew up in Virginia, and when he was a child, his local school board and Department of Social Services ordered that he be placed in a special school for children with learning disabilities, so that he could get help and intervention for his autism, but his parents disagreed and wanted him to be placed in normal public schools. The school board refused, so his father Bob sued the school board, they moved to a new county to avoid the order, and Chris was homeschooled for fifth grade and went to a public middle school, and later a public high school. It isn't clear why his parents did this, but one theory is that because Chris's parents were old, they had grown up in a time when people with learning disabilities were placed in institutions and forgotten about, and they thought something like that would happen to Chris if he went to a special school. Unfortunately, Chris was placed in public schools at a time when high-functioning autism, or Asperger's syndrome as it used to be known, wasn't really on anybody's radar, and they didn't have proper supports in place, so he never got the help that he needed. Chris's parents also don't seem to have taught Chris how to socialize, instead they would encourage other children to play with Chris, and in one case his father Bob actually paid a kid to be Chris's friend. When Chris was in high school, there was a group of girls that felt sorry for Chris and chose to occasionally hang out with him. Chris called them his gal pals, and his parents arranged for them to throw a party for him during prom, though he ended up having his mother as his prom date, which in retrospect seems to be an ill omen of things to come. Now, these might seem like nice things to do for a kid with a learning disability who has kind of a sad life and doesn't have many opportunities to socialize. However, Chris thought that all of these people were actually his friends and liked him for who he was. He thought that his gal pals were actually interested in him romantically. But in reality, all of these people were just acting out of obligation and because they felt sorry for him. This led him to think he was more socially competent than he actually was, and it ended up being a huge shock to him when he went out into the adult world and wasn't able to make friends or get a girlfriend. It was also a huge shock to him when he later realized, as an adult, that none of his gal pals had actually liked him. He came to view it as a betrayal, and his belief that he had had a happy childhood was destroyed. This sent him into a deep depression and contributed to that steady downward spiral that I mentioned earlier. So in the end, what Chris's parents actually did made things worse. Instead of trying to develop Chris's social skills so he could go out into the world and get what he wanted and needed, they created a pleasant illusion that filled him with false confidence and ended up hurting him even more than it would have if he hadn't had friends at all. Some people think we should hide the cruel nature of the world from young people, particularly those with disabilities, and the story of Chris Chan is a great example of why we shouldn't. Children all grow up and have to go out into the world and deal with its unfairness, and we need to give them the tools they need to do that. Any illusion we give them is going to be broken eventually, and it will make it that much harder for them to face the music when they inevitably have to. Of course, Chris's parents couldn't hide everything from him when he was a kid. Chris was bullied in school because of his disability and was sometimes treated badly by strangers he interacted with because of his bad behavior and poor social skills. His parents told him that this happened because the world just didn't understand people with autism, that he was fine just the way he was, and it was the bullies that had the problem. Now this might seem like a nice Mr. Rogers type thing to say, but the problem is that Chris ended up developing a victim mentality with regards to his autism. There were numerous occasions where Chris did bad things and was chastised for them, and he ended up thinking that this was happening not because he had done something wrong, but because people were just being mean to him because he was autistic. And his parents would encourage that viewpoint throughout his life whenever he got into trouble. So you can see the issue here. Parents of children with learning disabilities are often overprotective of them and are inclined to take their side when people are being mean to them. But it's important to remember that people with disabilities have moral agency and can do all of the same messed up things that normal people do for the same reasons. They need to be taught decency and responsibility, just like everyone else. There's also a much wider cultural phenomenon that I think enabled Chris's parents in this respect. The self-esteem movement, which had just started to pick up steam when Chris was in school. This was when kids started getting participation ribbons and when they started being told things like, you're special just the way you are and just be yourself. Now, this is something that might help kids with shyness, which is knowing what to do in a social situation but not having the courage to do it, but it's not going to help people who are socially awkward, which is not knowing what to do, regardless of how you feel about yourself. All children need guidance, especially children who don't know what they're supposed to be doing, whether they have autism or not. If all you tell them is, be yourself, that's not going to help. The self-esteem movement came out of the belief that imposing too many rules and expectations upon children is harmful. But we're now finding out the hard way that it's equally harmful to give them a huge amount of freedom and no guidance on what to do with it, and that the added arrogance that high self-esteem will give them isn't going to make things better. And this is what happened with Chris Chan.
So having considered all of this, if we go back to Chris Chan and his sign, here is a man who, as a result of his disability and the way he was raised, had a combination of poor social skills, naivete, arrogance, and a victim mentality. A person like that is going to need help, but isn't going to know they need help, isn't going to want help even if they do, and isn't going to be able to take responsibility for his bad decisions. I've spent a fair amount of time over the years researching Chris Chan, and I've come to the conclusion that it was these four things combined that consistently destroyed her and prevented her from getting any better or learning from her mistakes. Had any one of these factors been absent, she probably wouldn't have ended up being the way that she is, and the trolls wouldn't have been able to exploit her in the way that they did. Had her parents raised her better, and had she gotten the early intervention that she needed, things would have probably been very different. Part 2. The Trolls Made Chris Worse Okay, so what happened next in the story? Well, Chris Chan started posting the attraction sign at his college, and it was torn down by college staff, probably because they considered it to be solicitation. Chris kept putting his sign back up, and also started distributing pamphlets talking about how he wanted a girlfriend. He was eventually brought before an administrator named Mary Lee Walsh, who told him that he had upset some people and that what he was doing wasn't appropriate. Chris Chan didn't understand why she was upset with him and became very angry and combative because he thought she was trying to stop him from getting a girlfriend and was therefore a bad person. He yelled his catchphrase, curse ye ha me ha, at her, stormed out of the meeting, and later sent her an email containing this picture, Christian Weston Chandler's evil glare. Christian Weston Chandler it was his full name, although it's now Christine Weston Chandler course. As a result of his conduct, Chris was suspended from his college for a year and recommended for a mental health evaluation and anger management classes, which he completed. He later graduated college, but never did anything with his degree, never got a job, and was later banned from campus after sending a series of strange apology letters to Mary Lee Walsh. A few years later in 2007, Chris was very much the same as he had been then. He was still angry at Mary Lee Walsh, and he was still carrying his attraction sign around public places. He also liked to draw comics of a character named Sonichu, a combination of Sonic the Hedgehog and Pikachu that he came up with when he was in high school. He would draw them with crayons and post them on his website, and he also made a Sonichu medallion out of modeling clay that he would always wear. Chris also began expressing himself on his YouTube channel and recorded songs about how sad and angry he was that he didn't have a girlfriend. One of the most famous ones was a cover of the Backstreet Boys song, I Want It That Way, which he called So Need a Cute Girl, also known as Virgin with Rage. Here's a clip of it. I never wanna hear I have a boyfriend. Tell me why I'm stuck as a virgin with rage. Tell me why I so need a cute girl my age. Tell me why I never wanna hear you say I have a boyfriend. Okay, so here was Chris, who appears to have been genuinely expressing how he felt, yet he didn't understand how cringy it would appear to other people. He made a few weird videos like this, and when the trolls discovered him later that year, there was a wealth of content for them to make fun of. Chris came to their attention when some people noticed him carrying his attraction sign around in public and posted pictures of him on the internet. The trolls found him hilarious, and decided that it would be really funny to exploit his naivete, narcissism, and loneliness so that he would do more hilarious things. One of the ways they did this was by sending him messages saying that they were women and that they were interested in him. Chris would then start chatting with them, they would begin what he thought was a long-distance relationship over the internet, and the trolls would eventually start asking him to do ridiculous things to show his love for them. They would then share the fruits of their exploits with all the other trolls. There were numerous people who did this, and describing all of the stuff that happened would literally take hours, but I'm going to focus on two incidents here. One of them concerned a troll claiming to be a woman named Jackie. One of the things Jackie asked Chris to do was to send her a video talking about all of the sexual things he would like to do to her. Now, Chris appears to have gotten most of his information about sex from watching pornography, and he didn't understand that what he saw in porn wasn't what sex was like in real life. So here's the video he sent her. Hey Jackie, it's me, Christian. I'm doing this video for you, gonna upload it to the media fire. Hopefully uh, trolls will not get that to there. I'm gonna show I'm gonna show you some ways on how I can pleasure you orally. Okay. I yeah I got a few ideas like you know I would definitely give you some finger play, lots of fingers. But yeah, I'll just yeah I could be like I lick your pretty little. There. Tickle your 
Oh, and here's the fun part. I put my I can roll my tongue. I put I push I put it in there. And extend it while it's in there. Can you imagine that? Okay, so if Chris had had good people in his life, there would have been someone to tell him that this wasn't normal or acceptable behavior and that he made a fool of himself. However, there wasn't. Instead, Jackie told him that she really liked the video, which ended up reinforcing his warped ideas about sexuality, a theme that would continue throughout his dealings with the trolls. Jackie, of course, leaked the video to everyone. Jackie got Chris to make other videos that were even more bizarre. This included a video where he goes on a date with a blow-up doll pretending it's her, a video where he humps a blow-up doll while saying, who's your brony, and another video where he pulls his pants down and farts on a chocolate cake, in a recreation of the internet shock video, Cake Farts. Jackie told him that these things would really turn her on and showered Chris with praise for making them. Again, if Chris had had role models who were looking out for him and were able to explain how relationships worked, he would have known that these were things no normal person would want and that Jackie was just trying to exploit him. There's also a bit of a cautionary tale here for parents. If you don't provide your kids with healthy information about sex and relationships, the internet is going to help fill the void, and that probably won't be a good thing. Kids with autism who are socially isolated are even more vulnerable, for obvious reasons. The next incident I want to talk about concerns a 13-year-old troll who went by the alias Blue Spike. Blue Spike pretended to be a woman named Julie and spent hours having phone sex with Chris. Since Blue Spike's voice hadn't broken yet, it was easier for him to pretend to be a girl, although he still wasn't very good at it. Chris ended up sending him a video of himself having sex with a blow-up doll while yelling the name Julie, which Blue Spike, of course, shared with everyone. Blue Spike also hacked into and stole Chris's PlayStation Network account, then called up Chris pretending to be Julie's evil brother, and told Chris that he would only give him the account back if he destroyed his Sonichu medallion and shoved it up his butt, which he did. War! War! Until I can't see it! War! Shove it up! Shove it up! 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 up. War! 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 Oh, I can't wait to see how brown it is when you take it out. Chris, is your hand stuck? <laughs> it don't want to go in. Then keep trying. Make some Listen. room in there. Stop this shit. Stop it. Really. Alright, fine, you can stop. Blue Spike later called Chris one last time to tell him that he had been a troll all along. Um, Chris? Julie? There's something I've been trying to tell you for a while. Yes? This whole time, Chris. You've been having sex with a 13-year-old boy, you sick fuck! What? Yeah, I'm a 13-year-old boy, Chris, and you've been having sex with me this entire time. I'm gonna give all your fucking data to Chris Hansen, you fucking pedal fork. So you better get the fuck out now, before I Ugh. report you to the fucking feds. Get out. Ugh. Now, wait right, right. I did not know you were a 13-year-old. Yes, you did! They're not gonna believe you. They're gonna fucking put you away. So, let me guess, you were matched the whole time, weren't you? And Julie, yes, both of them. Both figments of my imagination. The there is when... no Julie. Oh, she never God. existed, Chris. She died five years ago. Who have you been talking to? Oh, boy. As you might imagine, this experience traumatized Chris for years. Of all the people who trolled Chris, Blue Spike is one of the most hated, and this story goes to show that the people trolling Chris weren't all just pranksters who wanted a cheap laugh. Some of them were deeply sick and evil people, and Chris's naivete and lack of social skills made him a sitting duck for them. The trolls also thought that Chris's Sonichu comics were funny, so they made fake Sonichu fan sites and would send Chris fake fan mail, pretending to be fans of Sonichu. They sent him fake letters from Nintendo claiming that they were interested in creating a franchise based on Sonichu, and some of them would even buy Sonichu merchandise that Chris Chan sold on eBay. Chris ended up thinking that people really liked Sonichu and that he was talented, when the reality was that the trolls just wanted him to make more Sonichu comics and do more stupid things so they could laugh at him. These types of shenanigans continued for a while, and Chris reached a point where nearly all of his social interaction was with internet trolls, who were constantly manipulating him into believing and doing stupid things. Now you might wonder where Chris's parents were in all of this. Why weren't they monitoring his internet use, and why didn't they cut off his internet access when they realized what was going on? We know that Chris's sexual escapades and negative experiences with the trolls were things that they learned about while they were happening, partly because the trolls would prank call his parents and send them pictures of Chris having sex with blow-up dolls. We don't really know. We do, however, have a video where his father yelled at him for putting pictures of their house on the internet, as his parents were compulsive hoarders and they were worried that the city health inspectors would have their house condemned if they saw what it looked like. 
the inside and outside tour I did a few months ago in my house. Everyone here today, my mother and my father are angry at me. They're blaming me. It's my fault. I admit, it's my fault. I want everything about my house off the internet. I'll send in detectives. I'll send in police. I'll send in everything in my power to get it off the internet. Listen to me. Listen to me. Yes. Listen to me. Yes. Shut that goddamn thing off. I don't care what you do. You get all that stuff off of there. Tonight. I'm working on it. Go work on it. I am working. Do you realize? Do you realize something? Let me tell you. If the health department of Greene County sees those videos that you put on the damn internet, they could condemn our house and we would have to move out of it? I see. You go get that goddamn stuff off of there and fast. I'm working on it. I was making a YouTube a video for you to tell everybody to get the images off of the internet. It's, oh. it's, not, it's out of my control. Oh, you get them off. It's out of my control. I don't know where to go. I don't know you where to go. You loaded them up there. You unload them. I'm working on it. Go do it. I am working. I am doing it. I'm sorry. Get in the hair and do it. I other than this, they don't seem to have made much of an effort to stop Chris, and indeed, they didn't. Obviously, this is something that a good parent would have cared about, and if Chris Chan's parents had stopped him from using the internet, that steady downward spiral would have been stopped. However, they didn't. They let him spend all day by himself in his room, and didn't really pay any attention to what he was doing. Another question to ask is why Chris didn't wise up after being tricked so many times. Well, we can only speculate, but again, pretty much all of Chris's social interaction was with trolls, and they knew exactly what buttons to push. The trolls created villains for him to fight and drama for him to be a part of, and made him feel like the hero of his own story, which was much more exciting than the real world that he lived in. Of course, the story gets worse and even more bizarre. As the years went on, Chris Chan became increasingly deranged and miserable. His father Bob died, his house burned down, and he and his mother were thrust into poverty, supported only by welfare checks and donations from concerned individuals who had heard about him. Chris Chan eventually decided that he was actually a woman and became transgender, all while claiming to be a lesbian and having a lesbian soul. Chris wanted to get sexual reassignment surgery, and someone on the internet told him to take a knife and cut a hole into his taint to make a vagina, and Chris actually did it. Thankfully, he eventually got medical attention after he put up pictures of the wound and a concerned troll told him to go to the doctor. He also tried to make himself a clitoris by piercing the skin below his testicles with a metal rod, which became referred to by the trolls as the unclit. Chris stated that he thought his piercing would make him better at performing some of the lesbian sex acts he saw in porn, but he ended up having to remove it because it got infected. The story of the unclit was seen by trolls as evidence of Chris's declining sanity. Some backed off, but others thought it was hilarious and continued trolling him. Now, this raises the question of whether Chris was really transgender, or if something else was going on. This is a bit of an elephant in the room when it comes to people with autism, because a disproportionately high number of young people who are becoming transgender are on the autism spectrum. This isn't something you would expect, and there's a concern that some of them are doing it because they are confused about their identity, because they want to rebel against society, or because they're isolated and want there to be a subculture where they can fit in. Perhaps it's because they aren't comfortable with who they are, and blaming their problems on their gender is an easy solution. Given everything that happened to Chris, there's also a question of whether his transition was part of a weird ploy to get girls, or whether the trolls had basically bullied him into becoming transgender. Although these are concerns worth exploring, a small but vocal fringe group of trans activists have created a social climate where anybody who dares to question a person's desire to transition, however well-intentioned they may be, is branded a transphobe. If these concerns are true for some people with autism, the activists are doing us all a disservice and making their lives worse and more miserable. This is a controversial issue, but if there ever was a case where a person's desire to transition should be questioned, this is that case, especially if we consider all of the other things that Chris Chan believes about herself. You see, a few years ago, a group of trolls known as the Idea Guys decided to see the extent to which they could manipulate Chris into believing ridiculous things. After months of talking to her, they were able to convince Chris that Sonichu was real and lived in an alternate dimension, and an event called the Dimensional Merge was going to cause Sonichu's dimension and the real one to collide and create a utopian world where fictional characters would all become real. They also convinced Chris Chan that she was a magical computer from the video game Hyperdimension Neptunia, and that other people in her life were magical computers as well. Unlike many other trolls, the idea guys were fairly secretive about how they did all this. Chris Chan also came to believe that she had psychic powers and was married to the Pokemon Mewtwo. 
If we watch Chris's YouTube videos where she talks about these things, she is indistinguishable from a paranoid schizophrenic that you might see wandering the streets. Be aware of your surroundings. The changes are going to happen as the two dimensions merge. And you might see some villains attacking. We the superheroes, I'll be fighting us alongside them. We'll fight them off and defend both of our worlds. You are indeed a goddess. Just like I became a goddess. Because we were bestowed memories and everything. And also keep an open heart and an open mind for telepathic communications from your counterpart in C-197. I have been married since last March to my magic chance sign Chiu and Grizel Rose Chiu and more recently became married to Savannah Rose Chiu and Mewtwo. So you can see the concern here. Here's Chris Chan saying, I'm a woman, but I'm also a magic computer, I have psychic powers, and I'm married to a Pokemon. So we have some pretty good reasons to question things Chris Chan believes about herself. This is an extreme example, but it shows us that a person's gender identity shouldn't be this sacred thing that nobody can ever question. Or we risk enabling the delusions of people who are disabled, seriously mentally ill, or just plain disturbed. Returning to the idea, guys, they also used Chris's delusions to extort money from her, and were stopped by other trolls who were disgusted by what they were doing. After this happened, a lot of the trolls backed off, as they realized that all of the trolling Chris had endured over the years had basically driven her insane. Things weren't quite so funny anymore, but it was too late. In addition to all of the personality flaws Chris had that prevented her from getting help, her sense of entitlement and her experience of being repeatedly betrayed made her distrustful of people who tried to help her. There was no turning back, no undoing the damage that had been done. And thus, that goofy young man who carried an attraction sign and wrote terrible covers of Backstreet Boys songs became the mentally deranged woman that we see today, being led away by police on charges of incest accused of having sex with her mother. Part 3. Could Chris's downfall have been predicted? People who commit serious crimes often have a history that led up to it. That history often begins with behaviors that are immoral but not illegal. It escalates into things that are slightly illegal, and then eventually they do something really bad that they become infamous for. This was the case with Chris Chan. We can see some of that immoral behavior in his dealings with Mary Lee Walsh, as well as many other conflicts he got into with friends, family, and strangers over the years. He has also been convicted of other crimes in the past. The first of these crimes was a hit-and-run charge. Chris Chan used to like going to a store called The Game Place, but he was eventually banned from there after getting into repeated conflicts with staff. And in 2011, Chris attempted to go back anyway, was chased out by the owner of the store, and then he and his mother Barbara proceeded to both hit him with their car on the way out. They were both charged with felonies, but pleaded down to misdemeanor charges and ended up both getting probation, meaning no jail time. This was after Chris's father had died, and it's believed that most of his inheritance was spent on their legal bills for this case. The second crime was an assault charge. In 2014, a video game called Sonic Boom was released. Chris didn't like the cover for this video game because it showed Sonic the Hedgehog having blue arms, whereas he had had flesh-colored arms in his earlier Sonic the Hedgehog games. Chris decided to solve this problem by going to video game stores and putting tape over copies of Sonic Boom on their shelves so that Sonic wouldn't have blue arms. He went to a GameStop and did this and was asked to leave. As he left, he sprayed a GameStop employee with mace, which was captured on camera. <laughs> Unfortunately for Chris, they did call someone. Chris was again charged with a felony, but pleaded down to the lesser charge of misdemeanor assault. Again, he got probation as well as a lifetime ban from the GameStop and the shopping mall that it was in. So there's a question here about whether these were just sentences and whether going to jail would have stopped Chris from escalating his behavior. The jury's still out for me on that, but one thing we do know is that the judges appear to have taken pity on Chris because of his autism and deplorable life situation. In addition to this progression in his criminal behavior, we can also see a progression in Chris's bizarre sexual behavior. Chris started out having a half-baked understanding of sex that seems to have been cobbled together from the Bible, his high school sex education classes, and porn. Before the trolling began, Chris met a girl at the game place named Megan, who was probably the closest thing to a friend he ever had. Chris was fairly homophobic at that time, so one of the things the trolls later did to bully him was to call him gay. Chris decided to prove to them all that he wasn't gay by uploading a picture he drew that depicted him fingering Megan. Of course, she found out about it and sent an email to Chris saying that she was creeped out by what he did. Chris responded, 
As for the drawing itself, I've realized that it was done not only out of inspired fantasy, angst against ED, which was some of the people trolling him, and love for you, but also a major release for my crazy mixed up hormones. If I didn't have the foresight to put my pent up frustrations and feelings in the form of something, I might have become an abusive maniac. So thank God for allowing me to release my bottled up frustrations in a more positive, yet not so politically correct, and not so physically hurting others method. Be the release as it may, I am hurting so much more than you can be, because I have been taking abuse from those jerks on ED. So Chris seemed to think that this was an expression of love and a necessary outlet for his sexual desires, otherwise he might rape her, I guess? He also minimized Megan's feelings and claimed to be the bigger victim here. As you might imagine, Megan stopped talking to him after that. So here we can see Chris displaying some of the ideas and behaviors that sex offenders tend to have. Whether Chris actually believes these things or is just trying to make whatever excuses he can is unclear, but what should be clear is that this isn't something that happened because of his autism or how his parents raised him, although they probably made things worse. And indeed, things get even worse after that. We also have the bizarre sex videos that he sent the trolls who were pretending to be women. He told one of the trolls that he would be willing to have sex with a female dog if she wanted him to, although thankfully she didn't try to get her to follow through with it. He also wrote a poem for Jackie called The Red Mane Deer, which is about a guy who has sex with a deer. The red mane deer is quite an elusive, majestic creature. She gallops with sweet grace and style on her hooves of twinkle and glitter. I approached with erect elation, her coat smooth as silk, her mane brushing my fingers like a spring breeze. Entranced with her temptation and beauty, I was truly surprised when she kissed me deep. Damn. And then I kissed her back, and we made truest sweet love. Chris claimed that the deer was supposed to be an allegory for Jackie, but people have wondered about that. There was another bizarre incident in which Chris tried to infiltrate a group of trolls, although he wasn't very good at it because they all knew it was him and played along. Chris, pretending to be a troll, gave them a few ideas for things they could do to him, and one suggestion he made was for them to try to convince him to rape the pastor at his church. Why he suggested this, nobody knows. When it comes to incest specifically, we can see a disturbing progression in Chris's thoughts and behavior. In his early conversations with trolls, Chris claimed to be against incest because it was against the Bible and was just wrong. However, in 2016, Chris left this rather telling comment on a news story about a mother and son who had been arrested for incest. I have a few things to say in response to this article. Firstly, the child was over 18, and surely the mother had talked it out with him beforehand. The child might have had social problems, or a situation where socializing or going out to socialize with other people was a greater difficulty. Moreover, it was the lifelong affections between parent and child. Also, the mother probably could not bear any ovum for children anymore. Anyhow, who among everyone in this world has not had a dream of having sex with one of their parents? Never acting on them ever, I myself did have dreams of having sex with my mother. Although incest is quite a controversial topic, but there are circumstances where there would not be so much harm as one may think, feel, or believe. The child is over 18, the mother is unable to have any more children at the time, birth control and protection is available and can be used. Plus, this offers a chance for better teaching the child how to better satisfy their eventual partners. The schools can only teach them from books, not so much practice, and nobody wants to end up being a 20 or 30 plus year old virgin. I know, that is a huge, enduring pain. Unless the sex act was abusive, hurtful, or would result in an unwanted birth of a physical or mental challenged child, I would not judge or persecute the parent and child. I would encourage the child to socialize more, maybe make it easier for the child to meet more people his or her age. Do not send the mother and son to jail. Okay, well, that's something that could just as easily have been written by a convicted sex offender. Like this guy. In the psychological literature, these types of ideas are referred to as cognitive distortions, and they're basically excuses that sex offenders make up to justify their behavior. One complication here is that when it comes to people with autism, there's a phenomenon known as counterfeit deviance that can apply. Counterfeit deviance is when a person with autism does something of a sexual nature that most people would consider messed up. But the reason they're doing it isn't because they're sickos, but because they don't understand social and sexual norms and don't understand that what they're doing is wrong. So is that what's going on here? Well, if you look at what Chris had to say, it seems clear that he knew society thinks incest is wrong and immoral and has chosen to disagree with that idea, for reasons he has very carefully laid out for us. So this is looking a lot less like this guy doesn't know any better and a lot more like this guy is messed up. Now, what's interesting about this comment is that Chris actually mentions the incestuous dreams about his mother that he talks about here in his phone call with the troll. When did you start having feelings for Barbara? 
obviously for well, for a long time, I mean, I remember even mentioning some time ago in one of my videos that I even had dreams where I had dreams where I had sex with her, obviously. Really? So, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that's right. The Oedipus comment. Oh, Oedipus, that's right, yeah. According to him, this is where it all started, and this comment gives us more insight into Chris's motivations than anything else we have so far. There are a bunch of critical observations about Chris that can be made here that I think explain a lot about why he is the way he is, so I'm going to talk about that a bit before moving on. At no point here does Chris say that he thinks incest is gross, which most people would be inclined to do. Chris admits to having incestuous fantasies and seems to be making a lot of very specific assumptions about why the incest was committed, which leads me to believe it's an act of projection. Chris is assuming that the son had sex with the mother for the same reasons that he would, so he views the son's behavior as understandable and reasonable, the mother as helpful, and he doesn't think they should be punished. Autism has also shaped Chris's thinking here, although this isn't to say that autism makes you want to have sex with your mother, of course. One of the deficits caused by autism is in something called theory of mind. Theory of mind is hard to explain, but it's basically the understanding that other people are different from you and have their own thoughts, beliefs, feelings, and so on that are different from yours. Someone who has good theory of mind will be able to understand the ways that other people are different from them and be able to make predictions about their thoughts and behavior using that information. Someone who does not have good theory of mind won't be able to understand how other people's minds work, and what they will tend to do in that case is to assume that those other people have the same thoughts, beliefs, and feelings that they do, which is what seems to be going on here. We can see the same thing in many of Chris's interactions with other people, such as the story of what happened with Mary Lee Walsh that I talked about earlier. Chris thought his attraction sign was a great idea, and the only reason he could think of that someone would want to stop him was because they didn't want him to get a girlfriend, so Chris assumed this was why Mary Lee Walsh did it and got mad at her. Now the important thing to remember here is that most people with autism will not respond this way. There are many people with autism who are just as impaired as Chris but who are aware of their limitations, who know that they often don't understand things, and who have the humility to look at a situation where something bad is happening that they don't expect and to say, maybe I'm wrong. But because of his personality and how he was brought up, Chris didn't have that. It didn't occur to Chris to look at his attraction sign and say, maybe I'm wrong. It didn't occur to Chris to look at this incest story and say, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this didn't happen for the reasons I think it did. After all, I have autism, and I am wrong about many things. So although Chris wouldn't think the way he does without autism, what's going on here isn't just autism. It's autism plus Chris being a bad person. Again, there's an argument that can be made about how the surrounding culture is making people like Chris worse. We now live in a society that accepts things like hookup culture, where people divorce sex from relationships, from marriage, and from emotions, and say that sex is just something you should do because it's fun, with no strings attached whatsoever. This is, after all, what you tend to see in porn, and Chris is someone who has never been in a relationship. She's only ever looked at porn. And although this may be a coincidence, at the time her comment was written, incest porn was one of the most popular categories of porn on Pornhub and some other popular porn sites, where you can see stepbrothers and stepsisters, stepmoms and stepsons, and so on. All fake, of course. And it remains a relatively popular category of porn today. In this kind of surrounding environment, it becomes harder to argue against sexually deviant behaviors like incest, and easier for people who are socially and sexually naive to become confused, and to not know how things are supposed to work. Again, this comes back to that issue of freedom without guidance, and it's not a good thing. As for what his relationship with his mother was actually like, after his father died in 2011, Chris lived alone with her, and she was basically the only human being he spent a substantial amount of time with, not having a job, friends, a girlfriend, or much of anywhere to go. After Chris's house burned down, he and his mom had to stay in temporary housing where they only had one bed, and Chris made comments to one of his many internet acquaintances that he had spooned with her, which is kind of messed up. One of the observers at his court hearings also described him and his mother being oddly intimate with each other, physically, which freaked him out. Given some of the observations that have been made about Chris Chan and his mother, it looks as though she might have had improper boundaries with Chris, which she might have seen as encouragement, and at worst, that at least some of what happened might have been consensual. The police haven't charged Chris's mother with anything, so they don't seem to believe that, but it's a disturbing possibility to consider. But the real smoking gun came to us on July 5th of this year, when the administrator of the Kiwi Farms website, Null, posted a private conversation that he had had with Chris. Chris told him that she had a new girlfriend that she'd started having sex with, but was curiously guarded on many details. She tells him that her girlfriend is over 50, that they've been using condoms, that everything feels right and good, and that they both want to be with each other. She tells him that they have sex every three nights, and that her girlfriend enjoys her so much more than all of the men she's previously been with. She also tells him that her girlfriend used to work in accounting. Null notes that Chris's mom has a degree in accounting, and was understandably concerned. Lo and behold, 25 days later, Chris gets arrested for incest, and it looks like the person she was talking about in this conversation was in fact her mother. 
Given that her mother has dementia, I would question the whole consent aspect of this, especially since Chris has repeatedly shown herself to be an unreliable narrator. It doesn't get much more fucked up than this, folks. As we can see, Chris wasn't a normal person who just woke up one day and decided to commit incest with her mother. It comes at the end of a lifetime of increasing isolation and depravity, the latest in a series of crimes Chris has committed. Except this time, she probably won't just be getting probation. Part 4. The End of Chris Chan People on the internet who study Chris Chan, or Christorians as we are colloquially called, have long been wondering what the end of Chris Chan's story would be. Will she ever get help and turn her life around, or will there be some final nail in the coffin that either kills her or ruins her life forever? After all these years, it now looks like the second of those two things has come to pass. What could have been a story of redemption against all odds now looks like it's going to be a story of imprisonment, disgrace, and death. Chris's father Bob died having seen all of his hopes for his son's future dashed to pieces. And his mother Barbara now suffers from dementia, her family destroyed, her home filled with trash, old, poor, alone, disgraced, and now raped by her son. Allegedly. Chris Chan created Sonichu when she was in high school. It's been over 20 years since then and she still loves Sonichu. Her room is still filled with children's toys. She still has no friends, no job, and no girlfriend. She is a person frozen in time who has only gotten worse rather than better. You can even see her ranting about Sonichu as the police arrest her. Yeah, you, you appear to be compliant. Hey, Chef Sonichu, your goddess blue heart, and I continue to stand strong and I maintain everything with quick fill and my Sonichus and those shoes and everybody. Whatever future she has in store for her now will not be pleasant. How much of Chris's sexual deviance is innate and how much of it was caused by autism, the trolls, the internet, and the environment she grew up in remains a matter of debate. However, one thing that is clear is that none of these things made it any better. Things didn't have to be this way. If Chris's parents had raised her differently and gotten her the help she needed, the trolls wouldn't have found her to be such an easy mark, and everything that followed probably wouldn't have happened. We would have probably never even heard of Chris Chan. Now, one of the reasons I've told you all this story is because, although Chris's story is extremely bizarre, a lot of the things that led to Chris's downfall also affect other people. If we look at the hikikomori phenomenon in Japan, or the incel phenomenon here in the West, for example, we see people whose life circumstances are somewhat similar to Chris Chan. Isolated young men who haven't gotten help for their problems, whose parents didn't give them the tools they needed to be successful in life, who are part of a surrounding culture that is largely indifferent to their plight and is making it worse, who spend huge amounts of their time by themselves on the internet, unsupervised, and who are falling prey to malicious individuals that are convincing them to believe stupid things and making them worse. Things don't have to be this way. One of the reasons I think it's important to study people like Chris Chan is that looking at the most extreme examples of human depravity, weakness, and cruelty can tell us things about ourselves. Who we are, who we are not, who we could be, who we should be, and where we as a society are going wrong. And although it may be too late for Chris Chan, it isn't too late for everyone else. In my internet travels, I've come across people who have said things like, I used to be unemployed, living in my parents' basement, and playing video games all day. And I decided to turn my life around because I didn't want to end up like Chris Chan. As bizarre and extreme as her story may be, it serves as a cautionary tale for society's lost boys and for parents of young men who are struggling to fit in. If you choose to turn your back on the world and all that is good and right, something like this could be your future. And who wants that? That's all I have to say, folks. Although there are people out there who have done a better job of telling Chris's story than I ever could, I hope my contribution to the discussion has been interesting. And one thing to remember is that in this video I have only scratched the surface of the story of Chris Chan's life. Feel free to check out the links in the description if you want to know more about Chris Chan. Have a lovely day.